Let's move into another week of our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word by taking our Bibles and opening them to Acts chapter number 13, where we will resume our study of what is typically referred to as the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Now, this journey was prompted by the Holy Spirit at Antioch in the second half of A.D. 44, it would appear, when the Holy Spirit told prophets, I want you to set aside for a job Barnabas and Saul. And that job turned into this trip. Uh, after they had been prayed over, they caught a ship across to the island of Cyprus, and they worked their way from east to west through that island, uh, town by town, synagogue by synagogue, probably through the fall and then winter of 44, moving toward the spring of 45. Uh, when spring arrived, they were apparently in Paphos, the large city on the western end of the island, the capital where the Roman governor was located. And there the Holy Spirit used them to convert that Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, into the belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it, it would appear from the text that this is when Saul starts being referred to as Paul. And I shared with you my conviction uh, that this is representing a client, uh, patron-client relationship between Saul, or now Paul, and Sergius Paulus. Uh, it was common practice that if uh, a, an official, someone higher up the social ladder than yourself, supported you in some way, uh, gave you money, uh, paid for your education, uh, adopted you, or anything like that, that you would take one of that person's names as your own to show that connection, to be in honor of that patronage. And so I believe that Sergius Paulus, who may have actually had family uh, in the next place where these guys are going to go, uh, I think he paid them to go on the next leg of their missionary journey. Uh, and that Paul uh, started reflecting that thankfulness for that support by using his name. Uh, from here on out. Now, where did they go? Uh, they went north from the island of Cyprus up to the coast of what we call Turkey today. Uh, they disembarked uh, in the town of Perga and jumped on the road that goes up and over the Tarsus Mountains uh, to a place inland uh, where the city of Antioch of Pisidia is located. It's a major crossroads city. Now, as they were making this next leg, their protege, their intern, their helper, John Mark, decided he would rather go back home to Jerusalem. And so he, uh, as Paul will describe it later, abandons them uh, at Perga and heads home. And we will talk about the fallout from that and how it impacts on the second missionary journey uh, when we get to that part of the story. But uh, the text basically tells us that they end up of Antioch of Pisidia, and verse 14 says, on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Uh, you're going to hear me emphasize this repeatedly. Uh, Barnabas and Paul both understand that the Jewish people have been prepared for centuries, a millennia and a half, to, uh, to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. 
they have the written word of God, the inspired word of God, uh, in 22 books or scrolls that are commonly held uh, in each and every synagogue and studied there. Now, those 22 scrolls, by the way, are the exact same text information that we have in our 39 books of the Old Testament. It's just a different uh, combination of some of them. But the point is that these two men understand that the Jewish people who attend synagogue services and who are devoted to the sacred Jewish scriptures are the most ready to hear the story of how Jesus died for our sins according to those scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to those same scriptures, and that he is the Messiah who, whose salvation message needs to be embraced. And so that's why they always seek out the Jewish community in any town they come to. And so that's where they go. First Sabbath they're in town, they go to synagogue service. Verse 15, after the reading from the law and the prophets, a uh, typical uh, service structure was uh, there would be a public reading from the scrolls, a selection from the books of Moses, from Genesis through Deuteronomy, somewhere in there. And then a selection from the prophetic books which is most of the rest of the scrolls. Um, the wisdom literature is a separate section uh, for the Jewish people, uh, but that only consisted of the four scrolls of the Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, Job was considered one of the prophetic scrolls. So they would have some sort of systematized reading from the Law and the Prophets during the service, and then the one of the leaders of that synagogue uh, would preach, would teach, would uh, make comment and application uh, from those readings for those attending synagogue service. Uh, or if they had some esteemed visitors, maybe uh, traveling rabbis, they would allow them to make the commentary. Well, verse 15 says, after the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, that is to Barnabas and Paul, saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So more than likely, when they came into the synagogue and people were talking to them, you know, getting a little bit of their backstory, it became known that they were itinerant rabbis, traveling preachers of Scripture. And uh, so that's why they're invited to speak. And Paul then stood up and motioning with his hand said, so here's his sermon at the synagogue in Pisidia of Antioch. And it should be a study in um, in using Old Testament information to introduce the New Testament story. So here's what he says. Men of Israel, you who fear God. So natural born Israelis and proselytes, Gentiles in the process of being adopted into Israel. Listen, which is Shema in Hebrew, uh, and so that would have been uh, kind of a, a big deal for Jewish people to hear. Uh, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. So he goes all the way back to the story in Genesis and then into Exodus as to how uh, the, the family of Israel became the nation of Israel, the ethnic group of Israel, a large number of people living in Egypt. And then with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. That's a reference to the Exodus itself, more of the stories uh, in the books of Moses. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. Now, that's interesting commentary because that is exactly 
what was happening during the timeout phase of the trip from Egypt to the Promised Land. Uh, they weren't supposed to take 40 years to go on this journey. It should have only been two years. Uh, but because of sin, an entire generation was doomed, judged, so that they had to die in the wilderness. And God just put up with their nonsense uh, for those 40 years. Verse 19, and then after destroying the seven nations of the land of Canaan, so that's all the ites that you hear, the Canaanites and the Hittites, all that bunch. So after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, that would be the conquest under Joshua, took about seven years. He gave them their land as an inheritance. They divided it up uh, at uh, a, a great big uh, ceremony amongst all of the adult men. Uh, every last one of them got a piece of property. Uh, all this took about 450 years. Now, that's a round number. Uh, the actual number is bigger than that. Here's how we know. Uh, According to the book of Genesis, excuse me, book of Exodus, it was exactly 430 years from the time that Israel the man arrived in Egypt under the protection of his son Joseph, and Israel the nation left Egypt under the protection of Moses the prophet. 430 years. And then, of course, we know that the wilderness wanderings were 40 years. So add that up. That's 470 years now. And then the seven years of the conquest, that's 477. Uh, so 450 is just an approximate number. It's a number to kind of get your mind wrapped around. That's it. We do that all the time in our history stories, too. Uh, after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. He doesn't even put a number on this period. It's several hundreds of years. Uh, he just wants to jump forward to Samuel the prophet, the next big man, big name of God uh, that uh, makes a difference in the lives of Israel, because he's going to uh, govern them for 20 years until they have a king. And that's what gets mentioned next. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. And so according to my chronology work, Samuel was prophet all by himself, leader of Israel for about 20 years. And then Israel demanded a king, and they got uh, Saul the king for 20 years. And so the end of verse number 21 actually adds that those two numbers together for 40 years. So the transition period from Samuel the prophet until the death of Saul the king, 40 years. Verse 22, when he removed him, remember that Saul was a bad king, a bad individual. And so he gets punished. He's killed in battle. Uh, and thereby removed from the kingship. So God raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Uh, that was said in the process of Samuel the prophet anointing and designating David as the king that would replace the soon-to-be-dead Saul, uh, that David was so much the moral superior of Saul because he actually did follow God's way of doing things, not like Saul did, where he basically did what he wanted. Now, we do know that David has a major moral failing later, uh, for which he and the nation pay severe penalties uh, but at this time in the storyline, David was following closely the heart of God. Uh, and this is the reason, this is the early reason why he selected to be the father of the later Messiah, 
which is where Saul or Paul goes next. Verse 23, of this man's offspring or seed is the word I prefer uh, because uh, the prophecy in the book of Genesis was that the seed of the woman was going to crush the seed of the serpent. That's a prophecy about Jesus saving us from our sins. Uh, the seed of Abraham was going to be the source of blessing for all the nations. That's all about Jesus. The seed of David was going to build a temple unto the Lord. That's all about Jesus bringing all of us together into a holy spiritual house of praise to the Lord. So offspring or seed here, day, uh, um, Paul says, of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Now, more than likely, all of this is happening in the Greek language, but in the back of these Israelis' heads, they are aware that the name Jesus, Iesus in Greek, uh, is the equivalent of the Hebrew Yehoshua, Joshua, and that that name includes the Hebrew word for salvation. He who is salvation is what it literally means. And so uh, he is the Savior, Saul says, or Paul says here, that God promised us. Now, before his coming, that is before Jesus came on the scene, John had proclaimed an immersion of repentance to all the people of Israel. That's how he got his nickname, is because he was out in the wilderness, and he was shouting, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, and uh, people were changing the way they think, changing the way they act. And as a symbol of that, they were being dunked under the water to show that they were being cleansed uh, for a new start. And so John, we are told by Paul, was finishing his course and he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So Paul brings up the understanding that some people back at this time period and it's not really been that long ago, because this is all happening in 45, and John's ministry started back in 27, 28. So not horribly long ago, and the news of it would have gotten all the way out to here as well. Uh, so uh, some people thought that maybe John was the Messiah, but John says, no, I am not the Messiah. I am not even worthy to be the Messiah's foot servant. Uh, the first servant was the lowest on the servant totem pole. Uh, they took dirty sandals off of dirty feet, cleaned the dirty feet up, and then presumably took the dirty sandals away and cleaned them up uh, and then helped the people back on with them whenever they were getting ready to leave the household later. And so uh, it was a dirty job. Somebody had to do it, usually somebody way down on the pecking order. And so John says, I'm not even worthy to untie the Messiah's sandals and clean them up. He's coming to save you. Verse number 26, Paul continues, Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, that's the nod to the proselytes again, to us, that is, to us believers in the Scripture, has been sent the message of this salvation. There's the focus again on Jesus' name representing what he came to do. He who is salvation. Verse 27, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. So Paul is ironic here. He points out that the big shots, the leaders in Judaism at Jerusalem itself did not recognize the Messiah when he showed up. 
did not understand how he fulfilled all the prophecies that had been read to them repeatedly every Sabbath day the entire time they were growing up. But they ended up fulfilling what those prophecies said would happen. Now, keep in mind, God does not make prophecy happen. God has reported in the past what will happen with great precision. That's what prophecy is about. And so he knows what the free will actions of different people will be. And so he just turns around and uses those things. So he predicted that the Messiah would, in fact, be betrayed and totally uh, abused and misused by both the Jews and the Romans, and that he would eventually be crucified. But he would resurrect on the third day and be the Messiah, the Savior. So Paul brings out here, he says, these guys ended up having everything happen according to Scripture, by their choices, by their free will choices to reject the Messiah. Verse 28, and though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they'd carried out all that had been written of him, they took him down from the tree, that's the cross. Uh, this is almost always an emphasis back on the Deuteronomy passage uh, that uh, criminals who were executed, their corpses, their bodies were hung on a tree for the remainder of the daylight hours as a warning to anyone thinking about engaging in the same activity. Uh, and so that eventually, over time, morphs into crucifixion, where the person is still alive when they are nailed to the wooden implement. Uh, typically, we're thinking in the form of a cross. Uh, and so here the point is, Jesus became a curse for us because cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. That's what the book of Deuteronomy says. Uh, and when that was all done, he was taken down and he was laid in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. There's the power over death uh, displayed by Jesus, prophesied by Jesus multiple times to his apostles. And for many days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. That's a reference to the apostles uh, and all the Galilean ladies uh, and the other disciples that knew Jesus firsthand and saw him in his resurrected body. It was a select group somewhere probably between uh, 500 and 600 persons total. And so we we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, that is, he's going to send us salvation through the Messiah, this he has fulfilled to us, uh, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, this is one of the Messianic Psalms. Uh, it is God's way of saying, you are my chosen son. It is a, a, a declaration that Jesus is the son of God, a prophetic declaration. And it's used by several of the New Testament writers in, uh, in this whole point that Jesus is God's designated son to carry out the messianic promises. Uh, verse 34, and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. And now he shifts to another uh, passage. Uh, this is Isaiah. Uh, the previous passage was from uh, uh, Psalm 2. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Uh, now, what was that blessing of David? The promise of the Messiah coming through the Davidic line. So Jesus fulfills all this. 
Verse 34, therefore, he says also in another psalm, this is Psalm uh, number 16, uh, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Now, that one I hope sounds familiar because Peter, on the day of Pentecost, actually used that text uh, to point out that David wrote this psalm, but it's not about him because his body did rot in the tomb. Jesus didn't because he was resurrected. Verse 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. So that's Jesus. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So the law of Moses could not save you, uh, but Jesus can. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And then we have uh, another quote uh, from um, Habakkuk and Isaiah. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. So in his climactic um, application of Scripture, he basically says, God has accomplished everything that he intended to through Jesus, and now salvation is out there ready for anyone that will embrace him as their Lord and Savior. And this is an amazing thing that all of us need to believe and not reject. And then, as they went out from that, the people begged that these things might be talked about the next Sabbath.